Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and I am here in musical theater heaven because I'm joined by the folks behind the hit Apple TV Plus series Schmigadoon. We have co-creator, writer, showrunner, executive producer Cinco Paul, and actors Jaime Camille, Kristen Chenoweth, Anne Harada, Jane Krakowski, and Aaron Tveit. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, it's a joy. Cinco, I want to start with you because I understand this idea has been gestating in your mind for quite some time, I, I believe. So I'm curious, why now? What what happened to make Schmigadoon a possibility now? Yeah, I mean, I literally, I had the idea or the germ of the idea about 25 years ago, I think, which is crazy, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And, you know, there, were, there weren't a lot of options for what it could have been at that time you know, certainly in the TV world was very different. Um, and then I got caught up in writing these animated movies and I was exclusive to Illumination. And so finally, when I was done with that, I started to think about what do I really wanna do? And I met with Lauren Michaels company, Broadway Video, and they mentioned, if you have anything musical, I thought, oh, maybe maybe Schmigadoon's time has come, <laughs> you know? And it, and it really was um, because the TV landscape has changed with streaming. There's room for a show as nuts as this, you know? As we, as we heard when we pitched it several places, this is a big swing. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what we, uh, we heard. And, and Apple was willing to take a big swing and all you need is one place, you know? And, and so that's why finally it, it's time had come because I think there's room for so many different types of shows now. Well, thankfully, I'm glad they took the big swing because uh, here we are. And all of you, I mean, have great Broadway and theater backgrounds. And so you know that usually a musical takes years of development to make it to a Broadway stage. This, I think, also had a very long development process. Were any of you there from the beginning? I think, Jane, you had a lot of uh, experience with the developmental process. Is that correct? Yeah, I was just asked to participate in some of the early readings and I fell in love with it immediately. I just thought, well, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be in it, that'd be great, but I'm definitely going to watch it. So I was so thrilled that I got to see the whole process really, like hear Cinco's music so early, see many different people do the different readings, get to know Cecily and, and her love of musical theater and her wanting to be a part of this project was so cool. And just seeing how it, it grew and developed and how clever really Cinco is. I mean, Cinco is, I think you love this show if you like musicals uh, or if you don't like musicals, but if you know musicals, you will get even a, another level of um, enjoyment out of it because I think he's just made such a clever, um, a fully developed clever script that has so much to do with musical theater and the love of musical theater. So it was fun for me to be a part of it ultimately. And I, I didn't even know what part I would really ultimately play, but I felt very lucky to come in and take my, my swing at the countess. <laughs> <laughs> my shot really, my gunshot, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, has, has it evolved, you know, in looking back at those early workshops, what was the evolution of the process like? Is it wildly different from from those first iterations? I, I, I don't think it's wildly different. different. I don't think yeah. it's that different, right? I mean, it's. A, I think when, when Jane was doing the table reads, and by the way, when you're told that Jane Krakowski is gonna be at the table read, it was like <laughs> my mind was was blown. It was phenomenal. And we, we wrote the Countess part specifically for her. But I think, you know, initially it was just a little longer. We had eight episodes, which we ultimately caught, cut to six. So. So there was a whole sequence where Cecily's character was at a convent <laughs> that got cut. That was, I think, the biggest, biggest change. But the, the, the basic, and, and Jane, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the basic structure and flow of it stayed pretty much the same throughout. It just got honed and refined and, you know, became more of what it was meant to be. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Well, if we fast forward to the filming process, uh, as as luck or unluck would have it, depending on what way you want to look at it, you were filming and making this during the height of the pandemic with very strict, you know, safety requirements, um, and that has to that has to change the shooting and the atmosphere. Kristen, how does that affect the atmosphere on set while you're working? We missed. We got to see each other so sparingly all together, and there was some people I never got to see, um, and like. 
I wanted to just go watch everybody do their thing. Yeah. That was the hardest part. You know, I wanted to see everybody do their thing. Um, but we were just so damn happy to be there and doing what doing what we love. I think that with the cones, like we've been so <laughs> we were just so happy to be doing what we love. Honestly, I think that, and, and I think we were all, I mean, I, I could speak for everybody on this panel. We were all very careful too, because we, none of us wanted to get, we didn't want to infect anybody. We you remember this was pre-vaccination for those who believe in it. So it, but we still, we, there was a feeling in the atmosphere when you walked on any set that we were doing a musical and it felt heaven. Yeah. yeah. And would you agree? Was was it hard not seeing your your fellow co stars in action a lot of the time? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just sort of the way the script is put together too. There's just only certain actors are gonna see on set. I mean, nobody saw Jane. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I was like Jane Cousins in this. Like literally, she parachuted you know, like, in. It was one <laughs> day where we all like a bunch of us walked past. Aaron and he kind of winked at Cecily or something and I was like that was my big scene with Aaron to me everybody <laughs> I mean this is kind of the way it's structured you're not gonna be able to hang out with people but we really were not able to like hang out together and it was very frustrating because usually that's the best part of being away is mm -hmm. that you get to make your own little planet of fun um, <laughs> and socialize and we just didn't get to do that very much yeah. But I think in a way that kind of then led to us all being closer throughout the whole process, because mm -hmm. then I know we all watched it like cheering each other's numbers right. on, like because we didn't yeah. get to see them. We were all at a read through together, um, but then we never got to see any of them being filmed because we were all so isolated for safety reasons that it felt like every time someone's number came on, you're like, oh, no, I get to see what Anne did or I get to see what Aaron did. And so <laughs> it made it kind of like our our friendship and how we got to know each other and our bonding as a cast actually lasted longer uh -huh. than filming because it kind of almost started once filming was done and we got to meet and do press and yeah. the, you know the pandemic lightened up a little bit where we were able to do more stuff together so I think it's actually extended our friendship as a core company in an odd way even though we I did not see anyone <laughs> and I, mean, Cecily, I never even met like the the crew, because the crew would have to leave like five minutes before the actors could come on. Like it was a very, very different situation of how to film, but it worked very well because luckily no one got sick and we got the show beautifully made. Do you remember y'all in rehearsal that, uh, like I know Jaime was um, watching a video of us rehearse till he could get there because we, you know we were all kind of getting there just maybe two or three days apart, remember? So he rehearsed with us on Zoom. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is just... <laughs> and there's Jaime, just, there he is doing it, you know, just doing it. No, but I agree that maybe going through COVID may get us, got us together because we went through this, like, it was like a traumatic experience, to be honest, to, to be, and, and that, you know, I told you, Sam, in our conversation that we still have a chat, an open chat with us and we love each other and we're always cheering what, each of us do and and it's just it's uh, the friendship got really for some reason without mingling the way we wanted to like mingle with each other the friendship got super strong and it's there so that's beautiful that's yeah. great. who has the best content for the group chat that's a tough one that's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> alan recently like posted photo he he branded to someone who had photos of me oh, yes. when i was like we were 14. awesome yes that was that and was so amazing. he posted these photos of me as it was horrific but um they were amazing no. his <laughs> content's <laughs> pretty good how old were you think of 18 how old or i was 13. <laughs> oh, no. i don't know i was i don't know i was 14 or 15. i was wearing these crazy little shorty shorts and it was <laughs> Oh, you were man. exactly we're, by the way, by the way that we're trending in Topanga right now, so good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, I want to dive into some of the, you know, the structure of this show because many of your characters are obviously uh, inspired by and pay homage to specific roles uh, from Golden Age musicals. Like uh, Aaron, your character obviously has a lot of parallels to Billy from Carousel. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it to then go back to Carousel and look at aspects of that versus creating your own unique 
aspects of the character? I think I think it was very important. Um, I I've always wanted to play Billy Bigelow, and I've actually never gotten to play Billy Bigelow, so I kind of got to live out all of my Billy Bigelow dreams here <laughs> in Trigadoon. Uh, and actually, when I when I first got the audition scene, I read the scene and I said, "Oh, I this is this is the bench scene from Carousel." You know, it's like it's exactly what happens, and that's when I first kind of understood or thought I understood what the show was trying to do, and I just thought it was really fascinating and. But the, the, the interesting thing is, and, and I thought this from the very beginning, you know, usually I would try to make it, I'd want to make it real and connect with the material and make it very, you know, authentic and simple. But this, I actually quickly knew, figured out I had to go the other way because it was like the more, I felt like the more one dimensional, the more kind of uh, stereotypical I could be with this character, the more it gave Cecily to bounce off of, you know what I mean? And so... It's, it was a fascinating experience that way, that I basically, instead of trying to figure out exactly what it was, I just kind of in my head was doing like what my version or what I thought or, you know, what Cinco thought that this stereotypical Billy Bigelow would be, as opposed to making it real, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, a very, it was a very unique experience that I'd really never gone through before. Yeah. Jane, do you agree with that? You obviously, the Countess is very Sound of Music inspired. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, obviously we're in the world that lives in the musical theater. So us being the heightened versions of those people. Um, and I think part of the joy is being recognized of who you are in the, the canon of musical theater. I think that's part of the joy. And the characters have that too. I mean, like Cecily's character and, and Keegan, they, they, that's their joy of them putting the math together of who everybody is, which is so fun. I mean, for me, it, it just was like a comedy blast. You know, I, I feel like I came in and I did a scene with, with Cecily and Jaime and I was like, all right, we're just jumping on in, right? We're gonna be as extreme as we can as these people. And then, <laughs> I literally rehearsed my car number in uh, two folding chairs in a, <laughs> an empty room with Chris Catelli. And I was like, so I think I'm gonna do a backwards roll into the back seat. That's what I, I have in my mind. That's what I'd like to do. And he's like, what? Like, it was, <laughs> I, was like, I think it'll just happen. Like, we're just gonna try it. <laughs> and then they got a car that was the smallest car, honestly, on earth, <laughs> but perfect for my five foot four frame, oddly. Cause we actually talked about getting a bigger car. And I was like, I don't know if I could do this in a bigger car. Like the car is working for us. I think we stick with this <laughs> tiny odd car that I could push off. However, it was just naturally happening. And it was a total joy for me. I know one of our producers came in. It was like, I was sort of like the assassin of the production. I just came in, never <laughs> met anybody, did my number and left. And it kind of felt like that in a small way but in the best way possible. I felt like I had such um, an instant comedy chemistry with Cecily, which I was so thankful for. And that happened immediate. And I loved my song. I mean, Cinco couldn't have written a song that would let me show off my wares, you know, any better than that. Um, you know, and you just kind of come in, love it, do it. And I, and kind of to Aaron's point, I remember the one note that um, our director gave me was, it was when we were doing the scene post the musical number in the car and the gun part was sort of added later and a rewrite and he was, he gave me the note to be more melodramatic, which is not a note. I usually get the opposite. <laughs> but uh, I was like, and I, it lifted it to another level. And I was like, yes, I know exactly what you mean now. And it was the way to make that reality work. It needed to go to that higher place for me to be able to point a gun at her and say, of course, I'm a Nazi and drive away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 think her. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's the key of what made all of these performances so great was there was a real commitment to like playing the truth of of the trope i guess is the way i'd put it is that like they really everybody what aaron's talking about is like a total commitment to i am this character and this trope and and heightening it uh in a way that like just like jane said like allowed Cecily and Keegan to play off of everybody, you know, because the more you were committed to the, 
that trope, the better all the comedy played. But 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 to me, like every one of you felt real. Like you really, like no one was winky winky, you know, which no. was which was was would be death to it. Well, that, yeah, know? I think that's the big difference. No one was making yeah. fun of the material ever. Right. You know, this I think could have easily fallen into uh, like a pantomime or parody, and I think that's what makes it really this love letter that we all because we all felt that's that it was it. because yeah. nobody's making fun of any of it there's no, the there's no beliefs were so strong yeah and so committed and so real and i think what aaron just said is absolutely right everyone told their story with love yeah love yeah. for musical theater love for the canon love for the parts that we got to play and that i think that's a big part of it too yeah it's um uh, that's interesting because i was uh, when i first described the show to one of my friends who was interested in it at first i used the word spoof and i said well spoof isn't quite right it's not a spoof uh it's really more of an homage to these things um was that always a, a clear line cinco because you have uh there's so much space in this storytelling that uh for we certainly in classical musicals don't have people coming out or uh, there's not a, maybe a lot of strong women perhaps, or you know, the gender equity is not always there. So was that always a, a line you had to pay homage to these things, but also create a lot of space for these new stories? Yeah, I mean, I was very clear. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I said, this is not a spoof, you know, <laughs> like every part of production, you know, just like to, that was, something I really wanted to clarify right off the bat that 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 is not what this is. I think Apple wanted us to legally call it that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Right>. for legal <laughs> reasons. But uh, for, to me, it's 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 like homage, but in a way that can also it's a satirical homage. Right. Maybe that's the best way, yeah. way to put it. And um, and that was always the intent to sort of lovingly point out the things right that were kind of backwards and messed up uh, about the shows in those days or just stupid you know but but always with love um well i i am thinking of the the parody nature and sort of at the halfway point jaime your song suddenly i think is a great example of how it shifts a little bit from parody to something very serious and it's kind of like the curtains pulled back a little bit to that truth you're all speaking of did you feel that shift when you're Doing that yeah, number? Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I don't know, Cinco, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the only like serious song uh, in, in, in the show uh, where, where you can actually, uh, you know, it's, it opens a possibility for Keegan's and Cecily's characters to actually have uh, another relationship or open up themselves to, to new relationships. And I think it was a beautiful, beautiful song. And of course, singing with Ariana, I'm sorry, uh, Oscar winner, Ariana DeVos. Uh, it was just amazing. But yeah, right, Cinco, I think, I think that, that, that you were trying to, to um, even though, just to go back a little bit on, on, on one, what my uh, friends were saying about, yeah, if, if you don't approach any, as an actor, if you don't approach a character with sincerity and honesty, it's nothing, it's air, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, whether that honesty and sincerity lives in a, in a ridiculous universe or a more grounded universe, it doesn't matter. As an actor, you have to approach characters with, with truth and honesty, right? And, and, and so if we were all, the Shmigadunians in a way were like tools for Keegan's and Cecily's characters to learn about their journey. That's how I see it. And I think that in the, in, in the moment that, that Keegan and Cecily are completely apart and they see the possibility of love and a new relationship, I think uh, that's why suddenly was kind of like a serious song, right? Cinco, like that really gave, gave uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I always conceive of it as this is a comedy about being in a musical that sneakily suddenly becomes an actual musical, <laughs> you know? And so suddenly, and then it's the last song, How We Change, or the real sort of oh. sincere heart on your sleeve songs, you know, that that ultimately I, that was always the plan, like, ha, 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 ha. Oh, wait a minute. What? <laughs> we're in it. We're, we're really in a musical. Yeah. But also it came at such that, like you said, Sam, it came at such a good time that um, if you just give audience sugar and sugar and sugar and sugar and sugar, yeah. you know, you got to have, and that moment was so well placed and beautiful. And, and I love, I loved that for Jaime's character. It just was perfect moment, if I may, just 
perfect time for it. Well, Kristen, speaking of perfect moments, I think we need to talk about tribulation a little bit because it's <laughs> oh my God. insane. Uh, it's just <laughs> insane. insane. <laughs> this fast paced patter song. What was your reaction when you found out not only is this incredibly verbose uh, lyrics I have to perform, but it's all going to be done in one take? Panic, terror, diarrhea. <laughs> um, and, then, and then just the challenge of it. And people say, oh, but you, you do musicals all the time, so you should, this should not be scary. And I know each one of you have probably been asked the same thing. But when you're doing it in one take and you have had such little rehearsal, see, we rehearse a lot. That's the thing. Broadway, we, we, we prepare. So that's the fun part of the process. And there was very little, if I may, you know, little, little rehearsal time for everybody. So um, I wanted to come with it pretty much in my mouth already. And um, I wanted to, like everybody said, how you look at the character. Mine was, well, it's the Harold Hill song, but she's such a she's from hell so <laughs> how, can I, how can I make this character fun to watch and that's the challenge of Mildred and that was the challenge of the role and when Cinco when I when I read it I I, I just I have I mean, I'd be an idiot I just bloom an idiot not to do it and it it challenged me in every way and the and the camera director and our chorus the chorus and I was just, I'm just going to tell you, I did a, a couple things for myself, just for my own personal pleasure. It was just fun. Each of y'all did them too. So y'all know what I'm talking about in your own parts, but holding the Bible upside down. There was a slight Nazi <laughs> salute. Um, just to harken back to Jane, you know, a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, just, there's just little things like that I had to do for my own self. But when you're, when you're working with genius, that man right there, you, you know, you, you come with it learned and you come with it ready to go. And so I looked at the character and I thought, who was she before? And I looked at Dove Cameron's character and I thought she was maybe a little bit of her and what makes people so nasty and hateful? That's really the question, but um, I would be a liar if I didn't say it was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> it looked it. And I, I should say, I mean, most of you, you're you're all doing mostly live singing for these numbers on set, yeah. which I know you're all used to sustaining yourself over a date performance a week Broadway run. But what is how does that compare to having to sustain yourself maybe multiple times, mm -hmm. multiple takes over a day? Aaron, how does that compare to like your work in Moulin Rouge? Uh, you know, doing an eight show <clears throat> as I'm as I'm still recovering here. <laughs> Doing an eight show week uh, for 500 plus performances is just like, it, it becomes like an act of conditioning and contrition. It's just a marathon, right? You're just, it's a whole different thing. Um, but I, I, I've been very fortunate that actually all the musical content that I've done on screen has all been sung live. Um, and I, I have this thing, and I understand that sometimes it doesn't work, but I have this thing when I watch musicals on screen that aren't live, there's a moment when people start to sing that I say, they're lip singing. Yes. It, just pull, it pulls me out of it for one second. And I just think that there's an immediacy when it's not, when, when people are singing live. And then, and then just logistically on set, you know, if you're, if you're pre-recording what you're gonna sing, you, you, you've basically made all your choices in a vocal studio two weeks before and you have no freedom on set, right? So, so I just think, I think it's definitely harder. It's definitely, you know, singing something 12, 13 times in a row or, is very difficult, but I just think it's, you know, in my head, I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to do this again tomorrow. I only have to do this today, <laughs> right? So, so that's how I, you know, kind of get through it. It's like, okay, I can, I can not sing tomorrow. I don't have to do this the next six days. So that, I think that's the difference, but I, I do, I think that there's a, there's an immediacy on set. You have freedom to do whatever. I just think it's, it's so much, the story is told so much better when you can, when you can do it live. I understand that you always cannot, but I, I, I want to always do it live. <laughs> and that was my, yeah, right from the get-go, I said, I want everybody singing, you know, to the extent we could because of COVID, you know, like with the big ensemble numbers, we couldn't always have every, everybody singing. But um, yeah, for exactly the reason Aaron says, it bumps me a little every time. Yeah. They sound too perfect, you know? It's suddenly, it's like this shift from talking to singing, and it sounds like they were at a mic, you know? Yeah. But um, 
but when you have people like this, right, who can do it, you you owe it to yourself to have them do it because the perf I I imagine as an actor it just is is so much it makes the performance so much better, right? Because you're you're doing it right then in the moment. So so um, I'm so glad elevated, we did it that way. It naturally elevates it to that higher level of stakes and that. And I have to say, you know, we, we got to make Schmigadoon when there was no live theater at the time. And I think that had a lot to do with it. And, um, you know, everyone, we all do this, you know, regularly and in, in shows and musicals, but we hadn't been able to do it for a year, two years. And so I, I felt like we were all kind of combusting to celebrate what we were missing so much. Um, and I think, I mean, it felt so freeing to belt stuff out again. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in there somewhere i just wanted to run up and hug like there was a couple of days i got to be with ann and i you know we're not really supposed to have touch and stuff and <laughs> and you know you're or you're supposed to say may i give you a hug but of course during covid i'm like ann <laughs> and also she was in my bubble so um you know we we had our starbucks and but just to get to oh, just to get to be in one scene together i was like so happy yeah i think i i i heard a couple of the crew mention i think it was a some and it very quickly made sense to me what kind of what you were saying jane that they you know we i was talking about like oh the days are long and you know, a couple of the crew people said no 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 this is the greatest thing we we might be the only people getting to watch live performance right now anywhere you know because we did this it was in september 2020 right there was no or september october november yeah, everything yeah. around the world was closed like and you know they said that they, they they were some of the few people maybe anywhere that were getting to see live musical performance and that really hit me you know that's something i was not thinking of at all and it you know i, I like to say that this would have been the, a great job in the best of times but the fact that we did this when we did this is just it's my, I it's my mind yeah i was doing comedy but in, to my dress rack <laughs> i needed it so bad you know i just needed it i just needed it so bad. Um, what was it like then because you know it kind of premiered also at the perfect time when it first aired the musicals weren't back on broadway yet so this was our only for audiences our only taste of this for for a bit that we had been so hungry for i think um what was that like seeing people what was the audience reaction and fan reaction that you guys experienced and did you have any you know on that? People, well, people come up to me all the time and rave about Schmigadoon. And I'm and I'm like, yeah, I know it's great. Because <laughs> to me, I've just been living with it for so long, but it's just like, well, obviously it's the greatest thing that was ever made. So, you know, <laughs> I'm so glad you agree. Um, but you know, I think they, they were really, I think they were really responding to the fact that it seemed to come out of nowhere. And it was like this huge gift back to a theater community. Do you know what I mean? From people in the theater community, that it was something that was so tailored for them. So, you know, perfectly kind of pointed towards people who love musical theater, that they were just even more grateful and more, I mean, I just feel like the support I've gotten from fans and friends has just been overwhelming, more so than anything I've ever done before. So yeah, no, it was incredibly special. What I, love about, I was doing an interview, a guy was like, you cannot pay me to go into a theater to watch a musical <laughs> theater. There's no way in hell I'm going to watch. And I enjoy the show so much. Yeah. And spoke, <laughs> that, that was like, wow, that's great. Because if you are a theater nerd, like we all are, you enjoy the show tremendously. But when the guy told me that he, despite, like he hates Broadway shows, and then he enjoyed the show so much that that told that me was, that was my brother Mark Chanowick that said that. <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say it, or my husband. <laughs> <laughs> there was also something, you know, because obviously I was in a Broadway show that was shut down at the time, right? And when we shot when we shot this, I was still convinced we'd be back on stage in January of two thousand one. <laughs> Oh. And then I was like, oh, we're going to be back on stage June of 2021. So I, I never in my wildest imaginations thought that this show was going to air before Broadway came back. So mm. it just ended up being such a perfect time because when it did air, everything was announced to be returning in the fall. So there was this energy about Broadway coming back in the community. And then as Anne was saying, the support was just so overwhelmingly positive that some in some weird way it ended up airing 
for that side of things kind of at the perfect moment where people were star for musical content. They were so excited that Broadway was coming back. And, uh, but yeah, it just blew my mind. I never in a million years thought that this would air before my show <laughs> reopened while we were filming it. And I'm glad I didn't know that because I just wouldn't have been able to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cinco, when you look at how successfully musical theater translated to this type of storytelling in this medium, does it make you think about other ways to adapt it and other ways to bring musicals onto screen? Yeah, Cinco, we want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, um, this show was, everybody here knows it was a true dream come true for me. I may get, I may get a little emotional, but, but it, it, it um, and, and it's just made me committed to like, I want to write songs for everything that I do. You know, I want everything that I do from now on to be a musical project because it's so joyful. It's just joyful and magical and, and it was true, like the and, and getting the response from people. This is a sh like my dream show to watch. You know, I would like I, I I would have been so excited to watch that show and to to see that other people responded the same way. Just like made me so happy. It was just pure happiness making it and then putting it together and then seeing the, the response. So I want to write musicals forever <laughs> from now from now on. So do you guys all want to? Do it with me. You want to be yes. in my yes. okay. We are already doing one sequel. I'm just gonna okay. say <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll we'll look forward to whatever uh you come up with uh beyond this. But um before we have to stop, I do want to get everyone's opinion on this because you you had mentioned before about you know it was COVID, you couldn't necessarily pop into set if you weren't working to see your co-stars perform. So I imagine it was as much of a surprise for you all to watch these numbers as it was for us in the audience. So what was your most uh, pleasant surprise to watch that you were blown away with by a co-star mm. when you finally sat down to watch it? Oh, that's such a difficult question. I mean, uh, the continuous shot from, uh, my, I'm sorry to go first. Kristen, incredible continuous shot. I was blown away by, uh, by Ariana's uh, number at the, the classroom. Jane's number instead of the car, like flipping instead of a mini car, like everything. I mean, because we didn't get to see any any of it. Like we maybe the last number we saw all together a little bit. Jane didn't because she was being successful in ten different movies. That's why she left. But <laughs> the ones who, who stayed in Vancouver, we only got to see that number live. Other than that, all of the other numbers were seen live, like like the audience did. So it was amazing. Well, it's not like we didn't know people were good. Do you know what I mean? I, I wasn't, like, <laughs> I wasn't oh trying my to gosh, say that. I'm I wasn't trying <laughs> that Krista Chenoweth could get through a pattern number or Jane Krakowski and her legs. What? Like, I, love it. I, love it. I will say though, for me, honestly, it was Aaron's number. Aaron's num Aaron's big episode made me laugh so hard. I had no idea that it would, would be so heavily. Billy Bigelow, every single moment of that whole thing, just, I was on the floor. I cried, I laughed so hard. I was so impressed, um, you know, because he's so well known for his dramatic his roles. His <laughs> pants, man, his pants, like the pants. Well, his pants, obviously, I've seen pants. the pants. Oh <laughs> the pants were, Aaron, they, Aaron, they, they were below your chest, right, Aaron? <laughs> just, just below, just below. Just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, nipples. I, I, actually, I gotta tell you something. I actually did sneak on set, and Cinco knows this because I want I want to be directing someday, and I wanted to watch and learn. You'd think I'd know, but I don't really know that much. But I watched. I got. I did sneak in, and before the COVID person came over and said, "Miss Chan, with you." you. <laughs> she had um, on the mustache and a beard. Everything. She was <laughs> and um, I. I, I'm with you, Anne. I, I loved it, but I loved, I could never pick out a favorite. I, everything yeah. topped itself. Awesome. It's and true. then I love the little boy that is Mrs. Layton. I mean, that, that <laughs> just got me. I mean, every time, every, I mean, I loved it. I loved Cecily and Keegan. I loved it. I loved everybody. I loved everybody's moment. Everybody's. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, it's it's really hard because everyone's yeah. just amazing. And my jaw was kind of on the floor and every number. But the thing that I was, the thing that I kind of was wrecked by was, was Keegan and Cecily at the end, you know, because Oof. especially Keegan's character. And I think it's so wonderful how the story and the thing that really made me very emotional is, you know, he hates musicals. He's fighting against being in a musical. And the way he gets her back is he puts himself directly in the musical, right? And it was just like very emotional for me to think about that. And uh, I just, you know, that I just think, but it was all, it was all amazing. It was all amazing. I think it's very emotional for us as musical theater people to have a, like we all know what it feels like to be able to express yourself yeah. singing and how pure that is and to sort of see a character who is very not that have that experience and have this big kind of like come to Jesus moment I think was very moving I don't know oh, wow. um, that that like muggles can understand what we are and what we, <laughs> how we feel basically well that was one of my favorite things to to see on Twitter or something people like wait, am I crying at the finale of Schmigadoon? <laughs> What's going on here? You know, to have it take people by surprise. And that was always the intent, you know, but it's so nice to, my favorite things are, are things that I laugh all the way through and then suddenly find myself crying at the end. You know, those are my favorite movies and, and shows. And so that was always the goal here. And it was always really fun to see people shocked, wait, this stupid little show is why am I crying? I don't even understand. Um, well, I, that's what music does, Cinco. I mean, that's yeah. really, it's the power yeah. of music, really. We sing, we sing because we can't speak it. That's, that's what right. we do. And when we do it poorly, we should be made fun of. But we didn't. <laughs> but also, I would like to say, and I know that, that everybody here will let me have this moment. I Cinco, <laughs> ask that you give me the Jane's car because I, I actually would fit in it wonderfully. And I would actually, I would actually that car is a normal sized car to me, sir. So yeah, I would well, have it. Yeah. Well, as you know, I take all the props home with me, <laughs> yeah. cars. So I think I can get that to you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> That'll be uh, the cover to the DVD is Kristen driving away in Jane's car. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you all so much for, for talking Schmigadoon with me. Thank you for bringing a bit of joy into the world with this show when, when I think we very desperately needed it. Uh, so Anne, Cinco, Aaron, Jane, Kristen, Jaime, thank you so much. And it was wonderful to meet you all. Wonderful to talk to you. Thanks, thank Sam. You. Thank, thank you, Sam. Bye, everybody. Love <laughs> you guys. Bye, bye. 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 love you. everybody. <laughs> See you soon, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. That was awesome. Oh, thank you.